Welcome to Tech on Top. Today we're talking Netflix, the media powerhouse. Today, Netflix takes up 26% of streaming traffic. We're jumping in with one of the founding executives, Mitch Lowe, to discuss some of the ebbs and flows behind the media powerhouse, some of the challenges along the way, and how it's come to be part of this streaming revolution. So Mitch, great to be joined with you. I want to jump straight in because this is just such a fascinating topic for a lot of our viewers and listeners as well, probably likely consumers of Netflix as well. 20 years ago, Netflix was just mailing DVDs and now it's one of the largest internet companies. So as someone that was on the inside from pretty early on, what were some of the core values and like success or the driving force behind the success? Well, you know, we we had a few... Um, kind of mantras and principles that uh, I think still hold true today, which is pretty amazing after 20 plus years. Uh, One of them was don't do anything that doesn't have a big impact. You know, so we were always looking for that hockey stick effect, you know, by turning this dial and that dial, uh, uh, could you see just meteoric uh, growth? And, uh, and especially find something that consumers loved. So we were constantly fiddling with price points and what you get and how you get it and, and always looking for that. And I think that, you know, continues to be true. The other, and I think the, probably the biggest uh, difference between Netflix and its competitors, it was, Netflix was always willing uh, to bet on the future, and they were to and sacrifice, you know, maybe short-term profits and and gains. And by that, I mean, in as an example, in two thousand and eight, uh, they essentially gave up the what was hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue uh, in the DVD by mail days, and started a streaming site which directly competed against its existing very profitable business. No one, you know, not their competitors, Blockbuster, you know, uh, the cable channels were never willing to do that. And I think you're seeing some of that today. I think over the next few years, you'll see that that still holds true where Netflix is willing to bet on the future. Because this is almost the the million dollar question is how do you make sure that in the story you are the Netflix and not the blockbuster and you're saying you really have to kind of sprint towards the problem, go hard or go home and think outside the box. Well, yeah, and you have to know your customer and your future customer, uh, not just who is who is currently loving and using your service, but what's the next generation and what do they want? And I think I think that's where we're seeing, you know, instead of it every ten years a big uh, shift in what consumers want, we're seeing it almost every three or four years a big change. So you have to stay close uh, to your customer and and especially your future customer. It's true, and I think I'm showing my age now by remembering growing up, going to the local blockbuster and picking out a DVD, and then there was the change of being able to get DVDs arriving in the mail that was seen as really revolutionary at the time. And what's interesting is in the 2000s, was that only 50% of the U.S. consumers actually had a mobile phone. So it was almost forecasting a trend. What you guys managed to do at Netflix was really forecasting a trend before it happened. Well, you know, um, all businesses seem to uh, evolve uh, from your original idea. You know, our original idea at Netflix was to build an entertainment uh, site, a site where people could get movie news, could, you know, see what movies are playing in the cinema, could read gossip uh, about the stars and the new projects. And DVD rental was really just a side project. But as we started, you know, we go, well, how come people aren't coming back? How come people, you know, might visit us, but never come back? So we were always looking for that. What's that, you know, one thing we could do better than anyone else. And, and being an entertainment site was not it. There there were, there was plenty of people doing that, but then the sending DVDs by mail really was a, kind of a, the objective 
was to prepare for the future, to prepare for what 10 years later became possible, which was which was streaming. And, and um, you know, that that's for businesses today, you know, you've got to be looking five, 10 years out and look at, at those young people, you know, who are doing things much differently than, than we all did, uh, like going to Blockbuster. <laughs> and the typical startup mantra as well is like, if you're going to fail, you fail hard and you fail fast. And it sounds like you were extremely agile along the way with trying and testing several different things, maybe even in one go and seeing what worked along the way and what didn't. And if something worked, focus all in and if it didn't pivot quickly so maybe you can give a little bit of a Netflix formula from along the way some of the things that worked and maybe what's really interesting for some of our founders and startups that are listening some of the things that didn't work along the way that no one really hears about now but looking back was definitely a lesson well you know and I talk about some of these stories uh, in my book which was just released uh, last week uh, it's called Watch and Learn, How I Turned Hollywood Upside Down at Netflix, Redbox, and MoviePass. One of the things that I was running, a, a kind of a stealth project, which uh, in a way succeeded too well, and therefore we had to shut it down, was a, an idea called Netflix Express. And, you know, the challenge in the first 10 years of Netflix was how do you shorten the amount of time between the time a consumer wants to watch a movie or a TV show and their ability to watch it? Of course, streaming was the ultimate solution to that. But along the way, in those 10 years, we tried all kinds of things from mini warehouses all over the country to get people closer to the shipping time. Uh, we tried having the envelope which you mailed back instead of coming to us, went to the next customer. And one of the ideas was Netflix Express, which was putting vending machines, Netflix vending machines in grocery stores all over the country. And we had a test market in Las Vegas where we put uh, essentially a, a Netflix Express kiosk where you could sign up as a new customer, return your movies, pick up new movies, and it did so well that I think we signed up 2,000 new customers in the first couple of weeks. We had so, so much uh, excitement about it that analysts got wind of it and thought, oh God, are these guys going back to the physical world? Or because it, we had gone public a year before this and our valuation was based on a digital future. And when the analysts got wind of this um, Netflix Express, our stock cratered. We, we dropped like 40% uh, in our stock and I had to close the project uh, down. So, you know, that was just one of many, many, many uh, things we did, um, you know, over and over again, we would, you're right, we would fail and fail quickly, but even more important, and this I think is one of the secrets of Netflix is that when you failed, you had to share that with your colleagues. You had to, here was what I wanted to do. Here is what happened. Here's how I failed. And it was a teaching experience to everybody else. Because as you say, you know, this mantra of failing quick and, and failing big is really, it doesn't do anybody any good if you're the only one who learns the lesson. You need to share that lesson and be proud of that, proud to be a teacher within your organization. So that was, you know, Netflix used to have monthly meetings where someone would get up and talk about their failure. And it was, it, I think that uh, was, was one of the secrets and still is a secret to Netflix uh, success. Awesome. And it, it couldn't have been easy as well when you did make that mistake is to go up and educate your colleagues and peers on the on the lesson along the way as well. So it probably was a kind of a multifaceted life lesson in that regard. 
one interesting thing that you said there was uh, regarding the Las Vegas vending machines for movies. And I think one thing that looking into the history of Netflix and the roadmap along the way was really a regional focus. It seemed that although the company was international and had users from all around the world, it still really focused on regional expansion when it comes to different movie sections and genres. Is that also something that you think was really imperative and it also hadn't really been seen before in this specific field. Yeah, the um, you know early on we learned that um, niche audiences, uh, whether it was uh, cultural or or genre, uh, were really important to growing kind of the loyalty and and the passion about Netflix. Uh, the first uh, attempt and learning of that was Hindu films and Urdu films where people just, you know, especially engineers in Silicon Valley, you know, who many of them, uh, their nat native languages or do, they were just crazy. Now I don't have to go get these clunky VHS cassettes from my local grocery store. And so the end on top of that, we're seeing over these last 10 years with Netflix you know, investing in Latin America and, and South Korea and all the other uh, kind of uh, film department, film schools in all over the world, that there's this kind of cross-pollinization of entertainment uh, interest. Uh, you know, there are people in Korea who absolutely love Mexican novellas and vice versa. So people are starting to expand their interest in film that they never would have seen, you know, had there not been this local concentration of, of um, you know, really, you know, you could call it niche uh, to the American audience, but it's not niche, you know, in Mexico City. Got it. And I think one thing that's really fascinating as well for our audience members is really this kind of migration when a company finally goes public and then the feedback from investors, you're suddenly open to more critique, probably more uh, criticism and also more pressure as well. So for other founders, other kind of organizations that are in this world that are listening, what kind of words of advice, wisdom, guidance would you give them? Well, you know, some of the biggest mistakes I've made are focusing on, on solving the immediate daily problems and not spending enough time on the overall, you know, kind of global strategy. And so, you know, when you become a, uh, a larger company, whether it's public or not, and you have in investors, um, you have employees and you have customers, you really have to decide which of those is you serve primarily. And, you know, the sad part about becoming a public company is the investors take number one. And so sometimes you have to make decisions that aren't the best for either your employees or your customers. Uh, Richard Branson, you know, it always says you have to, uh, you know, serve your employees first. They have to be number one. And his theory is if you serve your employees, they make great products and therefore customers love you. And if customers love you, the investors love you. Uh, but when you're a public company, sometimes you have to make more shorter term uh, decisions. But I would say, you know, you know, stay focused on the bigger issues, on the big strategy and uh, bring in other people to solve your uh, daily problems. That is a very good word of advice. Saving for something special? We have the newest solution. Banks won't give you the interest you need. In fact, they'll actually charge you for having an account. At Fluid, we offer a 4% interest rate on your savings, deposited daily. Sign up and download the app today. And you've said there the phrase global strategy. I think one really interesting thing for anyone that's in the media field, 2020 was a big year because 2020, everyone had to pivot. There was the global pandemic and that caused more people to move online. It changed how we viewed entertainment and also how we needed entertainment to distract us as the only real thing that we could do at that time. So how would you say companies can remain agile in these kind of circumstances, especially when we look at a company now being either recession proof, a business model being pandemic proof? What kind of are the core features that you would expect to see? Well, I think it's the 
you know, the at least for media companies, entertainment, whether you were making content or streaming content, the pandemic kind of gave everybody a false sense of uh, strength and, you know, a, a rosy future. And many companies did not prepare for the ultimate decline in how much interest there was in cocooning at home. And so I think the I think, again, what, what leaders and whether it's a startup or a big company uh, to future proof your business or pandemic proof, you have to be ahead of the trend. You have to dedicate a certain amount of, of your uh, company and especially the smartest people to being innovative. Like what new products are people going to want three years from now? You know, what what are people going to want if there is another pandemic? Uh, what if there's a global shutdown? So you have to, you know, you have you you have. What I always advise is bring in to your company some really young, first time job people, and listen to them because they, you know, and and if you have a fourteen year old daughter like I do, uh, you learn and awful lot about the future and and you can't just you know say oh well they're young they don't know what they're doing uh you know the the future is you know shorter form content more user generated content um you know it's it's media everywhere and so you know i think if you if you bring in young people into your company and ask them uh, you know, and the good news about first time employees or people who've never had a job is they don't know how to be politically correct. And they will tell you things your managers will not tell you. So I think that's important. More outspoken for sure. And if we did have this crystal ball, you've mentioned shorter form content, and I would love to touch on Movie Pass now as well, because this is also something where you've said we're disrupting cinemas. Cinemas right now as a concept don't work in the way that they want to. So if we do have this crystal ball kind of three years down the line, what are you expecting from how we do view video content and how the kind of the structure will will change and evolve? Well, I, and sadly, you know, I think cinemas are going to uh, be fewer and fewer and play uh, really only the big blockbuster type content. Uh, you're not, you know, what we were trying to do at MoviePass was uh, take away that a la carte decision making that essentially, you know, for the things that, you know, aren't, you know, marketed well or, or smaller films, you basically say, I'll wait for Netflix. And you don't get that, you know, big theater uh, experience. So I think theaters are going to, you know, slowly but surely focus more on the blockbusters. I think that, you know, otherwise there is going to be this merge of user generated content and scripted content uh, where it will not only be shorter. So episodes instead of being 30 minutes or one hour are going to be five minutes and seven minutes long. And but at the same time, they're going to string together great stories and great characters. Uh, and so people will be consuming more and more on their devices, on their phone. Uh, I believe that in the future, 10 years from now, there'll be monitors built into the sidewalks, into every wall you see. And in the same way, going online, usually someone knows what you're interested in. You know, if you were searching uh, for a flight to uh, Madrid, uh, you know, people, the what the internet knows that you might be interested in hotels. I think that same thing is going to happen when you're walking through uh, the mall and the monitors are going to know what you might be interested in and be dynamic uh, to talk directly to you. So, I think there'll be monitors everywhere. They'll recognize who's walking by. They may even, you know, bring up the latest episode of a of a romance that you're watching. And so, you know, I think I think that's uh, part of the future. And then part of it, I have no idea um, about. I think, in a way, you're you're remembering the blockbuster experience. I think in the metaverse world, may return. I think you may be able to walk into a metaverse of Netflix 
uh, with your avatar, run into other customers like you used to at Blockbuster, talk to them about movies. You may even be able to meet the people who are making the content or the stars and interact with them, you know, at their launch, almost have a virtual uh, red carpet event, um, you know, in the Netflix metaverse. So I think that, I think that that is, it's almost going to bring back the experiences we used to have going to, uh, 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 going to shop or going to browse, uh, but in this virtual uh, world. And I think it's really awesome that you brought that up because if we turn to kind of 2020, there was the surge of play to earn, especially across Southeast Asia, where people were then having monetization and incentives for playing these games. And I think that could also transpire into a media element. NFTs as well. What's your thought on kind of the merge between NFTs, owning your own video content? Is that also something you see as a disruptor or are you saying all eyes, if they had to be on play to earn NFTs and metaverse, metaverse is the one to watch for the video and multimedia content yeah i think the i think nfts will morph into uh user created content you know there will always be team like them but i think the growth area is is a um you know creating content uh, and you and utility around the NFTs. I think the metaverse, you know, this this combining gaming and sports and entertainment, I think is going to be um, kind of where the future is. And even though uh, you know, if you look at uh, people attend, especially young people going to sporting events, that's declining in the same way that going to the cinema is. Uh, yet. Uh, young people still love sports. So I think that, you know, the the new delivery methods are going to be a combination of a meta uh, sports event, uh, you know, with combined with NFT ticketing that gives you all this other utility. Uh, you know, maybe you get discounts on future uh, promotions and so on. But, uh, you know, like I said, half of the future, I have no clue. Uh, but I'm excited to to uh, watch it uh, unfold. And one thing that you ran- you mentioned in a, I was listening to you speak at a conference in Dubai around a year ago, and you mentioned kind of those frictionless transactions as a user and as a consumer, and there should be these elements removed just to speed up the process. So one reference that we have here, this video is sponsored by Fluid Finance, which is a bank alternative that links directly to your Web3 crypto wallet. So it removes the need for you to use a crypto exchange, saving you fees and also saving you time, which is really valuable in this new digital digital era. So I do want to turn to you and ask you if you had to pick one of your favorite seamless ease of transaction projects at the moment that you're watching or that you're looking at and going, they're doing it right. They're doing something good. What would that project or platform be? That's a hard one because I don't think, uh, you know, even the projects I'm working on still have a long ways to go. Uh, You know, in especially uh, creating a product and a service that consumers love. Uh, one of them that I'm a, a especially excited about is a company called Skillset that is really it's it's a masterclass for sports. So they're signing up, you know, big players, Lewandowski, and you know, big soccer players, football players, uh, to teach kids and other um, people who are interested, the skills and, and, and what you need to know uh, to be like them, uh, but not in kind of the straight video format, but an interactive format. But at the same time, you know, this company has huge challenges. Uh, you know, it's kind of a chicken and egg type of business where, you know, you have to be big uh, to great, get attention and to get big, you need lots of money. Uh, you know, it's just uh, the conundrums of launching new businesses, even though they excite me and I'm, you know, super interested in in them. Uh, they require lots of iterations, lots of pivots, uh, lots of, um, you know, turning of the levers. 
So we've covered some of the life lessons from the company and corporate perspective, but I do want to ask you on more of a personal level, some of the kind of challenges and maybe motivational words of advice you would give your younger self, because it's definitely some years of accomplishments that you've had along the way. And I'm sure a lot of people watching can learn a lot from just the resilience that you've had in the industry that has been changing, witnessing this digital shift. What kind of things, uh, words of advice would you give to people that are watching that are just starting out in this new digital world? Well, I'd say the main thing I've learned is that on the one hand, and this so this is going to be uh, two pieces of advice depending on what type of person you are. Uh, so over my career, almost all the great opportunities I've had have been a result of not analyzing the pros and cons or the likelihood of what I'm putting my time and effort into uh, being successful. So I hear an idea, I get passionate about it, I think it's a great idea, but I don't do the pros and cons, um, you know, you know, it's this is not going to work, this could work, and and then add them all up and decide methodically to go forward with it. And I, you know, Netflix in many ways would not have happened had I done that. You know, my wife and kids told me it was the stupidest idea they did. Uh, on the other hand, all my mistakes, all the all the businesses that a lot of harm soul and money into uh, that have failed are also ones that I have pros and cons I wouldn't have done. So if you are and if you are someone who just like me jumps into things. Sorry, just to stop you there. The connection went after you said your wife and kids. Are you able just to pick up? Sorry, it just it went a little bit wavy for a little bit. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, so you know the the my wife and kids uh, said that Netflix was the stupidest idea uh, they'd ever heard of. Uh, so did uh, Mark uh, Randolph and Reed Hastings' wives say the same thing. And I think you know many many businesses that I've been a part of that have been successful, um, you know, if you had done a pros and cons, you would say, you know, don't do that, you know, do something else. So for those people who are um, risk averse, who do the pros and cons and then decide very carefully uh, how to go forward, I would urge them to take more risk, do more things that just seem crazy, but fun. And then for people who are like me, who are, uh, you know, very comfortable with risk and very comfortable with just jumping in, uh, I would say maybe do a little bit more analysis, uh, because I have had probably more failures uh, because I've jumped in without thinking uh, than I have had successes, even though the successes have been wonderful, uh, you know, for, and I wouldn't have done them had I... So I would say, you know, depending on your personality, I would do a little bit more of the opposite. Amazing. Mitch, thank you so much for giving us a talk through of everything. We've definitely learned a lot during the episode. So really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's all for myself and Mitch. We'd love to hear how you found this podcast episode. So don't forget to leave a comment and also subscribe to the channel to not miss more content like this. Sending money internationally? We have the newest solution. Stop paying for swift transfers. It's expensive and you'll wait days before you see a result. At Fluid, our international transfers are instant, free and safe. Sign up and download the app today.